Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akil, and for today's episode, I had Anna McDougall on, who's currently Director of Product and Engineering over at Axel Springer, National Media and Tech, and we cover her journey from opera to the tech world, how mindset is way more important than the skills, because the skills you can actually teach yourself. And we also cover how she copes with the imposter syndrome. I'll put the links to her socials in the description below. And with that being said, enjoy the episode. Beyond coding. So I looked you up online. I saw mm-hmm. a lot of podcasts, but I never got the full story, <laughs> kind of browsed through it yeah. on how you got into the software engineering yeah, field yeah. in the first place. How did that happen? How far back do you want me to go? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can do your own, your own spin on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's start at the beginning. When I was eight years old, my, this was 1995 mm-hmm. for those playing at home. Um, my parents took me to a bookshop yeah. and I saw Learn HTML at home. Some, uh, it was something like that, uh, some book called that. And I was like, I want to do that. Okay. I don't know why, but I just wanted to do it. I loved computers from a very young age. Yeah. Um, so they bought it for me and I just worked through it. I sat on my dad's computer. I was very lucky that um, my dad owned a small business with like two employees. And so he had a computer that had an internet connection, which in the mid nineties was already like a big deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I got to sit there and open up notepad yeah. and um, write HTML directly into notepad and build websites that way. I uploaded them with FTP and the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's Old right. School, cool. Old school. Yeah. Um, you know, use GeoCities and Angel Fire for anyone who remembers I, those. I don't know what no, those no. Are. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> a different generation. You were like just being born yeah, probably. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, And yeah, so that's kind of where it started. I Mm. kind of made a few little websites throughout my early teens. I did a software design and development unit at high school, Okay. which I loved. I was very good um, at it. The teacher was not very Mm. good at it, again, because it was kind of a whole new thing. And there wasn't really like, yeah, there, there weren't really specialized teachers for that for high school at that time. Makes sense. Um, and so I actually ended up teaching the class, the HTML kind of stuff, because I knew it better than the teacher and won a little like school award for it, you know, nice. for special contributions and all that stuff, which as you can tell, I'm still proud of, <laughs> such a teacher's pet. Um, and I did that, but I was the only girl in the class. Mm. Um, and even though the boys in my class were lovely, I have no complaints, yeah. there, there's still a barrier there when you've got a bunch of teenage boys and one teenage girl yeah. and it wasn't, although they were friendly to me and they were nice to me, they weren't like actively involving me. Yeah. You know, they weren't actively including me in a social sense. Yeah, you were so the was, odd one out. I was the odd one out, yeah. yeah. And so um, I had other subjects I was good at where I wasn't the odd one out. And so in the end, I ended up doing a really arts heavy um, list of subjects for my high school exams so like drama english japanese and history japanese even yeah that's cool (laughs) it's not not uncommon in australia actually to to offer japanese as well okay how's how's your japanese terrible (laughs) (laughs) i I think i can only remember how to say i studied japanese at high school yeah and like hello and (laughs) you know those kinds of things but i can still read the um the alphabet the kanji not the kanji, okay. the, the hiragana and katakana. Yeah. I can still read them, even though I haven't practiced them for so many years. Like if I see them, I can still be like, oh, that says hiragana or whatever. And yeah. that's fine. That's like, really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so then I kind of completely left programming websites, the whole thing behind. I did a degree in media and communications. So that's yeah. like journalism. I also majored in Spanish and did some time in Chile. Nice. And um, so kind of doing, yeah, journalism, radio, TV, this kind of stuff, production stuff. Yep. Uh, and then after my degree, I thought, you know, I'm not sure that I'm actually a very good journalistic writer okay. for one thing. And I found it very difficult to break into production in yep. general. And so I decided to try for a whole bunch of other jobs. Mm. And the one I ended up landing in was kind of project management for conferences and for events. Yeah. Um, so I did that for about a year and a half before I then changed into digital marketing. Um, and digital marketing I did for Opera Australia. So the the company that runs all the operas uh, in the Opera House, for example, in Sydney. Really cool. So I was doing their Facebook, Twitter, 
all that kind of stuff, the, you know, the ads, but also the engagement, yeah. special promotions, all that kind of thing. Everything digital. Yeah. yeah. And also from time to time updating their blog. And mm -hmm. that included working with CSS for the first time. I'd never worked with CSS before because remember when I learned HTML. You didn't CSS have that. It was not a thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I got a little bit of exposure to it there. Yeah. But again, it was just like, oh, this is a nice, cool skill that I kind of still have from my teenage years. I still didn't think anything of it. Yeah. Um, I then, as part of being in the Opera Australia environment, I was meeting a lot of singers. I was listening to a lot of opera. Yeah. And I remembered that I also enjoyed singing as a kid. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll just take some singing lessons and do that again as a little hobby. Yeah. Um, and one of the opera singers was kind enough to agree to give me lessons. So I started doing these lessons every week on my lunch breaks. And very soon she said to me, look, um, I know you said you just wanted to do this as a hobby. Mm. I think you should try to go to the conservatorium of music. Okay. I think you could do this professionally. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. I've got a little <laughs> runny nose. When people <laughs> say that to you, that means a lot usually when that happens to me. Yeah. Like when they actually believe in you that yeah. you can do this kind of thing. Exactly. And it meant more as well because I wasn't looking for it. Yeah. You know, I wasn't going to her like, so, so, can I be a professional? So, exactly. You know, it was like, it just came out of the blue and I was like, oh, that's nice to hear. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I had always wanted to do that as well. So I, I said, okay, like let's try. Mm. I then ended up changing teachers to one of the teachers at the conservatorium and she kind of got me ready for the auditions. And then I was rehearsing every single day, every single lunch break. So I was working full time still. Yeah. Every single lunch break would head up to the practice rooms, um, you know, do my scales, do my arias, just trying to get ready for this audition. And as you can imagine, I got into the master's degree, therefore at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. Yeah. Um, in opera performance. Really so nice. yeah, so that began my two years as uh, an opera singer, I suppose, to yeah. begin with. St I completed that, I think, very successfully. It was really hard. Um, I didn't know any music theory, for example, and most mm. people who were doing a master's degree, as you can imagine, did a bachelor's degree yeah. in music. So they know all this music theory, they know music history. I came in basically being like, hey, I can sing really well and I can act. What do you think? Yeah. Like, <laughs> That's really cool. Though. So yeah. I didn't have any theoretical grounding and it was very intimidating. I can because, imagine. Yeah, it well, builds on top of that. Yeah. yeah. And, and because there was a standard that they expected that I wasn't aware of yet. Yeah. And it was way beyond the standards that I had for myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I had to adapt, adapt. Real quick. and it was, it, there were a lot of tears. There was mm. a lot of pain. I ended up paying for extra tutoring so I could try to kind of catch up. Yeah. Um, and by the end of it, you know, I got to sing in the star role um, in the final performance of my master's degree. Awesome. And I got hired by Opera Australia as a singer directly out of university. Yeah. Um, performing Cinderella for, for school kids. <laughs> really nice though. Yeah. So I was Cinderella. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, and so later I moved to Germany then to kind of try to pursue it as a career. There aren't yeah. that many full-time singing jobs in Australia. In okay. Australia, if you say I'm... I'm an opera singer. They say, oh, okay. And what do you really do? Oh, really? You know? That's like a side gig. <laughs> it's like, it's so, it's so not a career path okay. for the majority of people. I think there are maybe 30 full-time singing jobs in all of Australia. Yeah. You and know? in Germany, that's different? Yeah. <laughs> in Germany, every theatre has, uh, usually, has a full-time chorus of between 35 and 60 people. Okay. So, like, basically one theatre in Germany has more full-time jobs yeah. than all of Australia. <laughs> so the, the decision really cool. was pretty easy to, yeah. to come over. Um, and luckily, my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, yeah. um, also won an award and he got won a one-year con one contract um, at the same theatre where I had gotten hired. Okay. So we kind of got really lucky just coincidentally yeah. um, where we were able to work together there for two years and then I worked an extra third year there. That's so this amazing. is coming back to programming in a second, yeah, I yeah. promise, I promise. <laughs> it's a long story. Um, so during that time, of course, you know, we're living together, we're working together, things are going well, yeah. um, we decide to get married uh, and then I become pregnant mm. and planned <laughs> and we're super excited. But of course, by this point, he's gotten a new job in Leipzig. Yep. I'm still living in Wiesbaden. Now, for anyone who doesn't know German geography, they're basically on opposite sides of the country. Really? Um, so it was manageable but not great That's during a, a pregnancy do, yeah. yeah so basically I was living alone in an Airbnb while I was pregnant yeah um and then eventually of course once my maternity leave kicked in I handed in my notice and I went to Leipzig yeah 
So at this point, I'm heavily pregnant. I know I've got one year of leave ahead of me and being an opera singer while he's also being a singer while having a newborn is extremely daunting Mm -hmm. as in to give you an idea in the opera world, you receive your, well, at least I did receive your schedule for the next week on the Thursday beforehand. Okay. So you can't you plan, can plan anything. anything. No. Um, and it's just like that. It's always it's been just like that. that. And and you're working nights, of course, a lot. Yeah. Um, you're working weekends. You're working holidays. So all the all the worst times for trying to find childcare, basically. Yeah. Um, and so I was really thinking to myself, do I want to continue with opera? Yeah. After my maternity leave finishes which would involve, of course, doing auditions all over again, probably wouldn't even get anything in Leipzig. So Mm. then how would that work? The work of it, I loved the day-to-day job of being an opera singer. I often say, like, if you just took one day of work, being an opera singer is amazing and I love it. Okay. Right? But taken all together over time, I was like, okay, I've done this now for seven years. I know I can do it. I've been relatively successful in doing this. Um, but would I be able to lie on my deathbed and be happy if I had this, like, would I feel like I was fulfilling my potential basically? And the answer I came to was no. Um, I know that for a lot of people, my husband included just creating music for them. It's like, that's life. Like they, they love that. And that brings them the joy and satisfaction they need. And it's totally satisfying for me. It wasn't, I never really had that. As I said, I came in kind of late. For yep. me, it was more about performance. It wasn't so much about the music itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I also felt like there was an intellectual part of my brain that I wasn't using. I, yeah. I knew from wasn't the fulfilling. yeah from the corporate stuff that I'd done before, this project management, marketing stuff. Yeah, I knew that I was good in business. I knew that I was good with people and in the corporate world, so to speak. Yeah, it's a different ball game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I knew that I liked it and. I also loved logic puzzles and these kinds of things. And like, that was fun. But then I kind of started thinking, well, hang on. Back when I was a kid, I did this HTML stuff and I really enjoyed that. Maybe I should try it again or try something like um, JavaScript or Python, which I'd kind of heard of floating around. I'd had a software engineer for an ex-boyfriend. So he had kind of given me a very short introduction to JavaScript long, long ago. Okay. and there were kind of all these little things where I was like, ah, oh, yeah, I've always wanted to try programming again. And I really liked it as a kid. Was I actually any good at it? Or was it just like a kid thing? Yeah. You know? Only and one so, way to figure out. Well, yeah. that's exactly it. So I, I was getting towards the end of my maternity leave at that point, which meant, you know, the, the baby was a bit, a little bit more, um, didn't require like 24 seven access Care. all the time, you yeah. know? And I was like, okay, I should try it. Mm. So I found the Odin project, which is like a free web development course online. I've seen it, yeah. Yeah, and I just started kind of plugging away at that. My husband would take the baby in the first half of the day and I'd take her in the second half of the day. And that meant that I had the whole morning every day um, to practice coding. And so I would do between three and six hours of coding every day. Yeah. and was just teaching myself. The great thing about the Odin Project, and I, pro- I, saw almost, I promise this is not a plug for the <laughs> Odin Project, but the great thing about it is it teaches you like Git, it teaches you yeah, um, yeah general skills like uh, how to use a linter and, and things like that, not just, it's not like free code camp where it's like you just have this Make artificial environment. Work. and yeah. yeah. So you have to learn about all that stuff and it was great. Um, and I knew very quickly that I was good at it. Yeah. It was working for my brain. It was like a light went off and I was just like, hey, everything they're talking about, that's how I think. Yeah. Like that's how I break down problems. Like, oh, you have a problem, you break it down into steps and then you break those steps into smaller steps. Yeah. And then you like find a good structure that can work for those steps and then you break those apart. And you know, like it's just, it's exactly how my brain works with everything. Yeah. So it was a bit of a revelation. Uh, and of course I also had the Discord community of the Odin Project telling me, wow, you're going really fast, but you're also doing good work here. Yeah. Like you should definitely keep going. Very nice. So the big concern I had had, you know, as a, a new mom in my early thirties <laughs> was like, is anyone even going to want me there? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not like some young hotshot out of a computer science degree, you know, yeah. is someone even going to want to hire me in that scenario? And luckily the Twitter communities, this Odin Project communities, they all welcomed me with open arms. And yeah. it was like, everyone was just so lovely. And 
telling me like, yes, you you belong here. Like you, you should keep doing this. Really cool. And that, that was very reassuring. And then I did a one year kind of web development, software development course, like okay. a, what they call in German a Weiterbildung, which means like a continuing education yeah. certification. Um, and I also during the course of that became the tutor for the course. I was like learning the course, but also yeah. teaching the other students. Very nice. Um, and I got hired before that course finished um, by Novatech Consulting in Berlin. Okay. Um, so that's how it began. Yeah. That was March, 2020. 2020. No, yeah. wait, 2021. I got hired. Oh, 2021. Yeah. 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 That's like a year ago. Yeah. Not, not, that ago. Ago. No, yeah. not that long ago. Yeah. Not that long ago. Really cool though. Yeah. What I like is that. So when I was a kid, it was very intimidating picking a career yeah. path or even picking your your like electives that you were going to do. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. Exactly. Because that was going to kind of define your future career path, <laughs> right? And no pressure. <laughs> exactly. No pressure. It's the future we're talking about here. Yeah. And those decisions you make might close some doors. And I was like, man, yeah. that kind of sucks. Yeah. Uh, but luckily, I mean, even as you describe it, it's easy to pivot, right? Might mm. not be easy, might require hard work, but it is doable. Yeah. You went from kind of a marketing thing, more business oriented to completely something else opera and mm -hmm. and everything around that i yeah. don't even know what it entails but i can only imagine <laughs> <laughs> and then back to software right yeah. actually being able to teach yourself the skills of kind of creating software mm -hmm. is amazing right everything is out there online mm -hmm. even the communities yeah. you talked about encouraging you giving you feedback mm -hmm. and allowing you to thrive within a career path like that it just makes it feel amazing to be part of that community mm -hmm. exactly. and i think it's very unique in in the software space to have that as well yeah, true. And yeah. and I, I think, I mean, there is still some gatekeeping, unfortunately. Um, yeah. But I do think in general, it is very welcoming and especially in the online space. What do you um, mean by the gatekeeping part? Well, it's, this is, <laughs> someone asked the other day on Twitter, what's the difference between a software developer and a software engineer? Yeah. And my answer was gatekeeping. Mm. Um, because as soon as you use the word engineer... You know, you have these guys coming out of the woodwork being like, well, actually, I'm a real engineer if here. you're an engineer, it's yeah. a protected word and you can't really call yourself one. And I'm like, well, for one thing, if you do an informatics degree in yeah. Germany, it's called informatics. It's not called engineering yeah. anyway. So I, I just, who really cares? Like, I just, I just don't think it, it's wrong for one thing. I was a software engineer. My first job was junior software engineer yeah. and I didn't have any government agents like knocking at my door like, excuse me, exactly. yeah. <laughs> how dare this, you this use the term violence. engineer? Yeah. <laughs> so I just think like, and, and the, the fact of the matter is that the way our world is right now, fewer girls and women in particular, but I mean, we could talk about lots of different um, mm. historically excluded groups, yeah. but especially girls and women, we notice they're not coming through, you know, high school systems and into university systems yeah. so if we are like saying okay a software engineer can only be someone with an engineering degree yeah well like it or not you are actively excluding anyone who has come through in a different path and yeah. the people who come through in a different path are usually women yeah you know and that's so it's kind of like it or not that's a form of gatekeeping as yeah. far as i'm concerned anyway. it feels kind of short-sighted in that way hmm. yeah if you don't look past what you're saying yeah you might not realize what you're actually doing yeah. in that way. Exactly. And I, I don't think there's a difference. They also say software developer or engineer yeah. or just regular developer. I mean, exactly. would, would you expect a software developer to not know how to set up a project? No. Yeah. Would you expect a software engineer to never complete a basic ticket? No. Like yeah. they do both of them, both a software developer and a software engineer do both. I just think yeah. it's like that's the only difference. If you call yourself a software engineer, you'll have people like knocking on your door being like mm, are you sure <laughs> and if you call yourself a software developer everyone will be like okay whatever yeah you know and these these titles are not formal right <laughs> i can have i can be a cloud engineer cloud sec devops <laughs> i can create I don't all know, the can hardest. you call yourself a cloud engineer if you're not up in those yeah, clouds exactly, fixing those exactly. gears i don't yeah. know <laughs> if i'm actually creating software am i a cloud engineer if i just push stuff to the cloud if i, I do some infrastructure yeah there's no rules so no. i don't know why people create these kind of rules themselves yeah. and enforce them on other people. And, and I think the reason is that it's about protecting their own egos. Mm. Um, I think people, when you personally have always wanted to be a software engineer and you've like worked your whole life, you know, you've been a kid, you've done it at high school, you've gone into university, you've yep. worked your butt off to get this degree and then you go and become a software engineer. Now you've worked, let's say 10, 15 years in software engineering. And then you see someone like me, like a former opera singer with, like a year's experience being like, oh, now I'm a software engineer. Yeah, I understand why people don't like that feeling, mm. why that might make them feel 
like the title is somehow lesser. Yeah. But I do think in the end it's a thing to do with your ego. If if you're really proud of the work you've done, which I think those people absolutely should be proud of it, yeah. um, then it shouldn't really matter what title is attached to that because you know you've done that work and yeah. you know the experience you have. And if someone else is coming in as a, a junior or whatever and they're called software engineer, what you should be saying is, welcome, Yeah. I've got all this experience, let me help you become better. Exactly. And then you can be... You know, inflate your ego that way, basically, by helping other people. I think yeah. that's the best way to boost your ego is by helping other people. In, and I mean that in a positive way, like to help your confidence yeah. is to help other people and to show other people what they can do. And, um, yeah, I think everyone has something to offer. And I think that's what those people should be leaning into rather than getting defensive and feeling like, oh, no, like everything I've worked for is under risk. It's like it's not. You've yeah. still got your job. There's plenty of work for everyone right now. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. just – Go in, help help others, and show them show them what you know. Like pr- prove it, you know, and yeah. do it that way. Like boost your ego that way. That's exactly. a good way. Exactly. I I think it's the same people that say this is weird or that don't that can't think mm. further than just thinking it's right or wrong or mm. black and white, right? Because experience is, I don't know if it's additive, but it kind of blends together, right? If we have the same experience, we're gonna think the same, and the solution is gonna be the same. But if we have, if you and me are in a team, mm-hmm. our experiences are, are different. Mm-hmm. I also don't have a traditional computer science degree. Mm-hmm. I came here throughout my own journey and my yeah. own path. Uh, but no one actually said to me, you're not a software engineer or software developer. Mm-hmm. We're all doing the same things. It doesn't matter at the end of the day. Yeah. If you're in a team, your experiences blend together and together you figure out the solution. Oh. It can be more or less innovative based on the creativity within the team. But the more diverse, the more creative those solutions are the better the end result gets because of it. Absolutely. And yeah. I think I think the other thing to remember there is if you're creating, especially if you're creating software for everyone, mm. you know, an app that you expect to be used by by many, many, many different people. Yeah. If you don't then have many, many different types of people helping you create that software, yeah. you're going to have gaps. You're going like, to exclude people. You're going you're gonna to unintentionally exclude people. Yeah. You know, you might have the best of intentions, um, but in the end you just don't have that experience. You just can't. Like, you just can't know what someone from a different group is going to want or need. Yeah. You know, just like how I, you know, I as an atheist, I don't know what a Muslim person needs. I don't know what a Christian person needs. You know, I don't have that experience. Yeah. Um, as an Australian, I don't know what someone from Japan needs in an app yeah. or someone from um, Nigeria. You know, they have that experience. Um, so it's so important if you are creating international apps or websites that are going to be accessed by many, many different people. And especially we can talk about Ally here, you know, all kinds of things. This reaches into all different aspects. You need to therefore have a diverse group of people creating that product, Um, be it in the product side or the engineering side or whatever. You know, you just need to make sure that multiple eyes and ears uh, are in there on fingers, you know, touching, (laughs) touching the screen or whatever it is. But um, yeah, I I completely agree with that. Like, and I remember an example of that that I heard of was a a new, I don't even necessarily call it an app, but like a feature mm. in an airplane where you would sit down and it, the screen in front of you would say like, oh, hi, Anna, like welcome on board yeah. or whatever. Now, as soon as this rolled out, the trans community was like, ah, uh, this is a problem mm. because a lot of them had dead names yeah. on their official certification or on their passports. Yeah. So someone might come down, um, so for example, um, a a trans woman, and she might sit down and then it would say, hi, Adrian, welcome on board. And suddenly she's outed. Exactly. And that that puts her, unfortunately, even today in physical danger because there are still people who will, you know, beat people up for that. So, you know, there are things like that where you think, oh, it's so it's so what's what I'm looking for innocent like just so welcome someone on board yeah. but actually by flashing that name up so big you know anyone who was involved in um, queer politics would be able to tell you that that's a bad idea yeah. um, and it just comes through not having a diverse team involved in the process yeah so. yeah I mean if you're creating that you would think it's obvious right you yeah. use, use the name that's on their uh, their birth certificate or whatever yeah uh, and all of a sudden you have that on the on the back end of that happening. Exactly. And I don't even know if those people that actually created the software will get to hear the end of it. We'll yeah. get to hear that, oh, actually, this is the result <laughs> of, of those choices, yeah. basically. Because exactly. unfortunately, sometimes we don't even know what our impact is, yeah. um, positive or negative, mm, right? That's true. Which is a shame. 
because I think if you were if you would hear that, mm. you would take that with you towards the future, right? Yeah. That would be a new experience. Exactly. It's a learn. It's a learning experience. Yeah. That's the thing, and that's what I think. I'm a believer in impact over intention, um, mm. but I do think that if you are well intentioned, then you should view the impact with a learning eye. You know, okay. you should be saying, okay. I had the intention to do something positive. Yep. It had a negative impact rather than, than going defensive. Again, yep. like before, rather than going defensive and saying, well, well, I didn't mean bad, so it's not bad. Like, yep. you, know, you should be like, okay, wasn't what I meant to do. I apologize. How can I learn from this? How exactly. can I do better next time? Yep. And it just, I mean, it's the same as the thing I say for imposter syndrome in tech. It's kind of like the same idea. You know, rather than going in and getting defensive about what you don't know, yeah. you have to really go in with a learning mindset and being like, okay, I don't know this thing. That feels bad. I accept that that feels bad, but now I need to do something positive. Let's fix it. Yeah, yeah let's fix it. Like, let's ask people. Let's do the Google searches. Let's yeah. <laughs> go to Twitter, whatever it is. But like, let's find the answers. And then that can be the solution to this bad feeling I have yeah. rather than just going defensive, defensive, defensive. And it's a it's a relief, right, that you're in a space and that you are allowed to make mistakes yeah. as long as you learn from them. Yes. You're not expected to know everything. Yes. You are allowed to learn yes. what you don't know. Yeah. It just makes it it makes it more comfortable to be in this and to be unaware of the things that you don't know. Absolutely. Because it's a learning journey. So is life, right? As a kid, you don't know the world. So you <laughs> you pick up things, you put stuff in your mouth and you're like, oh, this is not really edible. And you put it back <laughs> as a baby. And you continue on, right? That's how you learn. You try things yeah. out. So even as an adult that we kind of oppose people to learn things and we expect people to know what they should know mm -hmm. rather than what they know and expect them to learn, right? Be that sponge and yeah. absorb knowledge. I think it's weird, but I do <laughs> I do see it shifting uh, towards more openness, making I people agree. more comfortable yeah. in the role that they have and allowing them to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I mentioned before when I came into this opera degree that I didn't know anything, yeah. you know, uh, about music theory and... People often ask me if I experience imposter syndrome in tech, you know, being <laughs> ostensibly an imposter. Um, <laughs> but I don't actually. It's, okay. it's not something I've I've had the unfortunate experience to, you know, the unfortunate luck to experience. You know what I mean? Um, because, and I think I think it's because I experienced it already in opera, mm. like hardcore. Yeah. Right? I was an imposter there too. Yeah. Like I've done this whole thing before. <laughs> And, you know, I've cried the tears and I've I've had the desire to quit and I've fought through that and created a successful career there. Yeah. So when it came to tech, it was like, oh, yeah, I've done this. Like, yeah. I've, I've been the imposter before. This is, this is fine. Like, I just have to keep learning and then eventually I'll get to the point where I can do this professionally, just yeah. like I did with opera. And no offense to programmers anywhere, but opera is harder than programming. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't mean to offend anyone, but yeah. it is like the Olympic sport of singing. Um, and I, I just, think I can agree with that yeah. because I have no clue what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, to give you an idea, yeah. with opera, not only do you need to know the music theory stuff, yeah. um, and not only do you need to be able to sing and hold a tune, that kind of goes without saying, we have no microphones in opera. And okay. you're singing over a 70-piece orchestra yeah. in a theater that can fit what? I don't know, 700 to 1,000 people, sometimes more. That's crazy. And you're expected to be able to project your voice from the stage over this orchestra <laughs> to the very back of the theatre yeah. with no microphone, right? So it is actually a super physical thing. You have to know how to physically hold your body, move your muscles, use your bones. Yeah. And it's actually a very, very highly technical um, musical field. Yeah. On top of that, you have to act, dance, um, move, uh, wear really tight costumes or big enormous wigs that are kind of trying to pull your head this way. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do all of that while lying on the ground or floating upside down on a wire. Yep. You know, like <laughs> it's a different it is, ball game again. It is. Yeah. I'm sorry, but programming is easier. <laughs> yeah. So when it when it came to like learning programming and and not knowing anything, I was like, well, if I can do it with opera, I can I can do this. Like yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's so different. Like it's yeah. apples and oranges, right? Yeah, you can't, true. You can't even compare the two. That's true. Yes. Is it? So in opera, can you learn those skills? Well, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. It's still the same. You can come in with a certain amount of talent and still teach yourself a lot of things or l cultivate those skills. So I think the Olympic sport analogy is a really good one. Yeah. Um, because as with Olympic sports or with Olympic athletes, mm. not everyone can become an Olympic athlete, right? Yeah. Um, 
you could learn to become the fastest version of yourself. Yeah. Um, let's say as a sprinter. So you might be a decent runner as a kid and then you go to a coach and you can get really fast. Maybe you can even be the fastest in your state, yeah. but you're not getting to the Olympics, right? <laughs> um, an average person will probably never get to the level of state, yeah. you know, but they can still learn to sprint really well. Yeah. Um, I believe the same thing about singing and about opera in general. Um, I believe the broad majority of people mm. can at least learn to sing. Yeah. Um, will everyone have the ability to become an opera singer? No, like it's just not. Some people just don't have the natural voice or they just, they just can't coordinate their body in that way. Or yeah. there are also physical builds that are more, um, that work better in opera compared to others. Uh, and you know, there are just some things you can't change genetically yeah. that, that do play a role in how well or badly you sing. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Um, and of course, some people are tone deaf and they will never they be will able to learn. Yeah. I like it's, and, and just like with programming, you know, some people, they just can't, they just can't wrap their heads around basic programming concepts. Yeah. Um, I believe those people are in an extreme minority. I believe almost everyone could learn basic programming skills. I was going to ask that, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> you do think that people can teach themselves in a more general sense. Of course. Yeah. To program more easily than they would, for example, go to the opera. And <laughs> yes, yes, I would say that. Yeah. Um, so I would say, I would say of the general population, yeah. let's say I believe probably like 70 to 80%, if they really wanted to, and if there were enough jobs for this, yeah. um, could learn enough to become an entry level software developer. Yeah. That's really cool. 70 to 80% of the population. Yeah. <laughs> for opera, <laughs> I would say like maybe if we're being generous, 5% of the population oh, could, yeah, learn, that's a huge could learn to be an opera singer, <laughs> yeah. like a professional opera singer on a stage, yeah. if they decided to and if they went out of their way to do it. It's really hard. <laughs> yeah. um, and luckily for me, I feel like it did also teach me a lot of skills that yeah. helped give me a head start in programming, despite the fact that they seem to be, oh, sorry, they seem to be completely separate from each other. There's a lot that I learned in opera that I feel like still helps me today, yeah. especially in my new role because um, I'm now, you know, I was a software engineer. I'm now a director of product and engineering um, at National Media and Tech, which is yeah. a tech subsidiary of the German media conglomerate Axel Springer. And we do like all these, we do basically everything for them. They're the biggest media company in Germany. Yeah. Um, and my job is kind of to oversee all of the tech products that we do, exactly. and all the tech projects that we do. So I have to like keep my eye on all these different things. Uh, my job is to come out and talk about them a lot, of course. Um, also uh, deal with some DEI, so diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives inside yeah. for our technical staff. I'm not in HR, so it's not really like for everyone, just, just our tech staff. If they want some representation at the highest level, I'm there for them. Yeah. And that kind of stuff, that kind of teamwork, speaking on stages, talking to you today, you know, a lot of those skills that I've learned have come from opera. Exactly. So it's not just that, for example, music theory and learning music theory has taught me a type of systemic thinking that helped me learn programming. I yep. believe that's true. Um, so there's kind of that more programming side of things, that more like technical side of things. Yep. But also in a non-technical sense, I feel like the skills I've learned from being a performer have really helped me a lot um, in my career, just yep. generally. Yeah, I think it's a wide array of skills that you need as a software engineer mm. or even when you go more high over, right? Yeah. And a lot of the stuff well, partially is technical, sure. You actually need to know how to do things, mm -hmm. but you can figure those out, right? There's online <laughs> resources for that. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, sure. Or sometimes you're trailblazing and you actually uh, have to try things out yeah, and learn that way. Trying, oh, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of the skills are also like human interaction, communication, mm. even psychology can help Absolutely. you. Um, which is then, I mean, comes back to what we said earlier, right? The diversity within a team makes the team better yeah. and the product as well at the end of the day. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because that's actually one of the skills that I really feel like I, I did bring across Yeah. Um, is empathy. Because, I mean, I like to think I've always been a bit of an empathic, like an empathic person in, you know, a social sense. Yeah. But the thing about opera or any type of uh, stage performance is that you are inhabiting characters, right? Yeah. So when you're doing a character study, you need to think, okay, what kind of background did this person have? How were they raised? What were their parents like? What was their school like? Um, 
why why are they behaving in that way in this scene? Yeah. Um, one of the roles I played was as this kind of older. Um, I should send you the clip. It's great. Um, <laughs> this kind of older princess, but she's the aunt of the main character, yeah. and she's disinheriting her um, from the will because she had a baby out of wedlock. Yeah. And That's she's harsh. the she's the evil character. Like exactly. she's the bad guy in in this opera, and that was me. Yeah. But I. When I walk out on that stage, I don't think, okay, now I'm the bad guy. I have to be like, I'm the good guy. I'm the only one who can see what's the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, because that's how she you would have to think. Shift yeah, no exactly. one sees themselves as the bad guy. So I have to be able to shift into different characters and think about how and why they act the way they do. Completely from their perspective. And I find that so helpful in software teams even because you often – do have people who are completely different to you. I'm this, you know, extroverted, loud Australian former opera singer in an yeah, engineering very team. Very unique. <laughs> <laughs> like most of the time there aren't a lot of people like me in a team, but I really pride myself in in being good at talking to people from many, many, many different backgrounds, yeah. many, many different personality types. And I would say most of the time we get along really well because I feel like I'm able to – adapt to their needs I'm able to try to yeah. see things from their perspective of course I can't because I'm not them but I can try exactly and um and therefore connect with them and make them feel more comfortable and that's what I aim to do in every team I'm on yeah mm. yeah that makes sense I mean I do it but I didn't do it like that consciously yeah right because you come into a team and you, obviously you want to make people yeah. feel comfortable you notice when people don't speak up yeah. Yeah. And some people do, or some people are the only ones talking <laughs> yep. in a meeting, right? You want to include everyone yeah. because you know their skills are valuable here, yes. right? We are still in a team. Yeah. A team is not a one-man army, but some teams apparently are. Mm. And if you can't make that same safe, safe space within mm -hmm. a team, yeah. then it's just going to be that one-man army. Exactly. And the result's going to be the same as well then. Exactly. And yeah. I mean, I'm not every meeting... I should say, not everyone responds well to meetings, yeah. right? Like there, there are some people who are never going to talk up in meetings, no matter what yep. we say or do. But that's also fine. And what I did in previous teams that I was on is that I would actually like go to those people after a meeting and just have yep. a one-on-one -on -one coffee chat or something and, you know, just kind of talk about them and what they're up to. And um, if they <laughs> want to talk about their ticket, give them that space to talk about it, yep. but not force them to do it. But very often that is where the real conversations with those people would happen yep. because they were just too intimidated by big groups no matter how comfortable or lovely they were um it was just they had this fear of looking stupid this imposter syndrome kind of thing creeping in where oh, if i ask like if i ask what a docker container is everyone's gonna like yep. think i'm an idiot and then like they're gonna fire me and you know i'll, I'll be gone by the end of the way you know this kind of oh yeah <gasps> anxiety yeah. yeah and it's like but when they're with me and we're chatting and they say, oh, yeah, and then I have to do something with Docker containers, then I can just say, okay, have you worked with Docker containers before? And they can say no. And I say, oh, do you, do you feel like you understand what they are or would you like me to go over it again for you? Yeah. You know, and then I, that gives them an opportunity then to, exactly. to ask that question. And, yeah, I feel like being able to put yourself in the shoes, in my case, of someone who's not as extroverted yeah. and to kind of think, okay, if I didn't like people as like or like bringing energy in from people. And if I weren't as confident in speaking, what would I need in this scenario? Like what would make me comfortable yeah. to, to ask something? And you have to be able to, I think, put yourself in that scenario. Yeah. Um, but I agree. It's not always conscious. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you like to think that after, after a while, you just kind of do it without thinking about it, which is, that's a good sign. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you do that automatically. Yeah, exactly. So I love that you said you learned how to cope with imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. Coming from the opera, teaching yourselves those yeah. skills and then being like, okay, this is a different ball game, <laughs> but still how to deal with that is, yeah. that, is the same, right? Yeah. What do you think the biggest factor there is that helps you cope with imposter syndrome? Um, I love talking about this. This is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> I, I love stuff. talking about this because, again, it's funny. I can go back to this topic of the ego that we spoke about earlier. Yeah. I believe, and, and, you know, might be a little controversial, I believe when you feel imposter syndrome, mm. that's actually your ego screaming out. Interesting. For reassurance. It's like when people fish for compliments, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's the same sort of idea. And a lot of people say, well, no, 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 I'm, I feel imposter syndrome because I'm not confident you know, and I think, well, 
I don't actually believe that. I think you feel imposter syndrome because you think you could understand this and you should understand this, but you don't, Mm. right? And so then you think I'm better than this. I should be better than this. I can be better than this. Why aren't I better than this? (laughs) And it's this kind of loop. So I believe it's your ego screaming out for reassurance, like that you are actually good enough. And that's often the response that people give when someone says, oh, I feel imposter syndrome. People go, oh, it's fine. Everyone feels that way. It's normal. You know, these kinds of, you're fine, yeah. this kind of stuff. I think that that, it's it's true. Like all of that is true. I don't think it actually helps the core issue of mm. imposter syndrome, which is that sometimes you are the worst one in the room. Yeah. Like sometimes, sometimes there is stuff that you should know that you don't know. Like, and I don't think there's anything wrong with just saying that, yeah. with being upfront about it. I'm a very blunt person in yeah. my life and I feel like it's important sometimes to be upfront with the truth, okay? Sometimes you are the worst one in the room. Yeah. Okay. So what? It happens. So what? Yeah. But also, this means, okay, let's say we've got six people around this table and I'm the worst one in the room. Okay, what do I have? I have an opportunity to learn from five people who know more about this subject than me. Yeah. That's amazing. That's great. (laughs) Why would I be upset about that? Like if we accept that engineering teams are open to failure and are open to learning. And if you are in fact in a company like that, you should be because I feel like most engineering teams are like that nowadays. Then you should be viewing every situation where you feel imposter syndrome. You should be viewing that as an opportunity to learn, not as some sort of slight on you. Because you can be the worst one in the room and it's fine. Like tech is an enormous field. There is so much to learn. No one at that table knows everything. Yeah. Everyone needs to interrogate other people about what they know in order to learn the basics of any field of tech. Exactly. Because like you could have the best backend engineer in the world. You say to them, uh, make a React app and they will stare at you completely blankly. You yeah. know, like they They'll have like, no well, idea. Let's you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So, to me, when someone says, "Oh, I'm feeling imposter syndrome," that says to me that they are approaching these situations with a mm. "I need to prove myself" mentality. Okay. So they might feel that they need to prove themselves to others. Yep. They might need feel that they need to prove themselves to themselves or to some hypothetical terrible parent or something like that, yeah. someone that they'd be like, oh, I'm going to show you, you know, but this proving yourself mentality is to me toxic, absolutely mm. toxic. If you go in being like, I need to prove myself, then you're going to put on a front. You're okay. going to be like, I'm great. I'm really good. I'm really good. Look at ev- look everyone. Look how good I am. I, kn- I know things. I know things. I definitely know things. Like mm. you're not going to be like, oh, okay. I've never heard of a Docker container before. What's that? Yeah. You know, and so for me, the change, the switch that is needed is from a proving yourself mentality into a learning opportunity mentality. Yeah. Viewing this as an opportunity to learn, as an opportunity to grow and seeing that as a positive thing. So I felt, I said before, I don't really suffer from imposter syndrome. I don't. Yeah. Um, but I do sometimes feel twinges of it. Like where I'm like, oh, hang on. Everyone's talking about, I don't know, God, Terraform. Mm-hmm. And I've never even seen it before like I don't know what I'm doing uh you know and in those situations I try to just catch myself and I think okay so you don't know about Terraform like no one's ever asked you to know about Terraform before so ask someone like learn and then the next time Terraform comes up in conversation you'll know what to do or you'll know at least the basics of what everyone's talking about yeah you know so I think that that approach that being open is really important. I think it's especially important for senior engineers yeah. because um, I think the higher you get in rank, so to speak, the more pressure you feel to know everything or to the be an expert. expectation is higher, yeah. But again, tech is a huge field. There are always going to be gaps in people's knowledge. Yeah. And the reason I say especially seniors is because seniors are in the unique position of being a role model for a lot of other engineers. Exactly. And if they can very, very openly say, oh, wow, I've never worked with that technology before. I'm feeling a bit of imposter syndrome right now. Um, George, can you help me understand this? Yeah. You know, saying it openly, I'm feeling yeah. imposter syndrome. I don't know about this topic. Can you teach me more? If you can do those three things as a senior engineer in a team, that's not only helping you as an individual, yeah. it's helping the whole team see, oh, this is a safe space to know nothing. That's a great example, yeah. <laughs> and we need that. Exactly. Like, everyone needs that. Yeah, I've never heard it be kind of match towards ego, I guess. <laughs> no, I know. I, I know I've had it, right? I've, I've come from 
<clears throat> more of an operational background. And then I I got very frustrated because I would know how to fix things, but I, but I wasn't responsible for that right. or I couldn't even do it. Uh, so then I moved to more of the engineering side. Yeah. Um, and I actually had nothing to start <laughs> off of. Sure, university knowledge, made a website yeah. here and there, but whatever. Uh, it wasn't a, an organizational setting. Do you know Git? Not really. Okay, let's start with that. And uh, let's make these changes here. Okay, we're going quite fast. Okay. And then a pull <laughs> request. And okay, I, I was pretty proud of that. And then I got like 40 remarks. And I'm like, oh, great. these people know their stuff. <laughs> so that's the, how it kind of snowballs, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's always there. You're always like, okay, uh, there's stuff I don't know. But I always saw myself as kind of a wild card. I was like, I, it's pretty obvious that I don't know stuff. Mm. So should I be ashamed of it? Not really. Yeah. I should learn from this, right? Exactly. All these opportunities, all these people are here. And they know a lot of stuff that I don't. Uh, but if I really want to do this, I need to be that sponge to absorb knowledge. It didn't make it go away, that mm -hmm. imposter syndrome. Like, it was always there. Yeah. It sometimes still pops up as exactly course. as you say it. But uh, you do learn how to cope with it, right? Yeah. You do ask those questions. Because you might not be the only one that's like, what's well, Terraform? Because you're still within a group. <laughs> and if two people are talking, the other ones are just being like, oh, interesting. <laughs> then it might not be the only one, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. So often when you think, oh, my God gosh, I don't know any of this. Yeah. Often there's at least one other person in the room who feels yeah. exactly the same way you oh, yeah. do. So it's really great if you can be that person to open it up. But I, I agree with you. I think um, I think it actually, in a way, it helps being an outsider yeah. with imposter syndrome, you know, because I can be like, well, yeah, obviously I don't know <laughs> exactly. about relational databases. Like, you know, I didn't go to uni for this, you know, teach yeah, me. Like, exactly. <laughs> how, how about we lay it out so we, we make sure everyone has the same Yeah, baseline. exactly. Yeah. Let's go back to basics for a second. What's a one and what's a zero? <laughs> <laughs> Where does that come into play? Because I've never seen it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard of these numbers before, but I'm not quite sure I'm seeing the connection. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think that does kind of help actually when you're a, like very obviously an outsider in a way, it gives you a bit of an advantage yeah. in, that, in that respect. But I, I do think that it comes down to honesty. Like it, it maybe goes even back to like your job interview. Yeah. If you're in your job interview and you're saying, oh, yes, I'm an expert in this and I'm an expert in that. I'm an expert in something else in order to try to get a job. Yeah. Then you're in a terrible position when you start. You said that expectation. Because now you set that expectation. Yeah. You have to work to that. Whereas for me, when I've been in job interviews, what I've always really appreciated is people saying, well, you know, with React, I could create a basic – you know, a website that, you know, could have like, for example, a restaurant website or something like that, but I don't know how to use APIs yet or something mm. like that. Yeah. Um, so that they can really say distinctly, I can do this. Yeah. I'm not sure about this yet. This technology I've just touched a little bit. Um, this tool I've used maybe once or twice. This other one I feel very comfortable in. Yeah. I love that because when someone is like that in a job interview, you know exactly what you're getting. There's no question marks. Exactly. There's no like... Uh, like, you know, are they telling the truth about really being good at all this stuff? Because there's no way you can test for all of it yeah. in an interview process. So you kind of have to take their word for it. You have to trust um, at some point. And then that person, if if you hire that person, the, the, the bragger, so to speak, um, and then they're in meetings, that's terrible for them too because now they feel like they're incapable of asking these questions. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like it's it's helpful from a unit lead perspective if you're giving people – space to discuss what they're not so good at it's helpful from a team lead perspective if you're giving space in meetings to give people um, space to not know yeah. about topics but in the end if you as a person as an individual are not being honest and upfront with what you're understanding and what you're not understanding you just kind of dig yourself deeper and deeper into a hole where everyone just assumes you know yeah. now and then you can get to the point where oh i haven't it's asked that question three weeks ago and now someone's asking me to do a ticket on it and i have no idea and now it's like it's not too late. I don't think it's ever too late. Yeah. But you can feel like, oh, now if I ask a question, it will. Everyone will be like, "Hang on, you didn't understand this it the whole feels time." Like you you're, know, uh, moving towards <laughs> so, the confrontation. Yeah. yeah, it just gets worse and worse. So it's just so important to to ask those questions, be open and honest about what you understand, don't understand. Yeah, just take the risk. Most of the time, people are fine with it. Like people it, appreciate it. Yeah, that's one of the oh, yeah. one of the points of feedback I would get yes. is that. Patrick, you're, so uh, we know you're kind of new at this, sure. <laughs> but you're also very humble about what you know and what mm. you don't know. Uh, when you say you don't know, but you can figure it out, I trust that, right? Yeah. I don't expect you to know. I just ask a question. Sometimes I ask people, do you know this? And we're going to do that. And it takes them way longer than I would think yeah. it should take. Is because they're figuring it out. And exactly. sure, they can know. 
But at that point, when I asked them, they didn't actually know, but they yeah. weren't, they weren't <laughs> comfortable telling me. Exactly. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm honesty is is number one with yes. me, right? I I don't want to set a weird expectation because then it doesn't fit well with me as a person if I'm disingenuous mm-hmm. and yeah. and not uh, act out of integrity. I guess. Yeah. Like I hold strong value within that. So if I'm disingenuous towards you, what I know, I'm disingenuous to myself as well. Absolutely. And either I need to figure that out or I shouldn't have said that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm honest in what I know. I'm also honest in, okay, should we actually do this? And I, I like to challenge a lot of things yeah. for people to also be like, okay, this is actually a, a conversation now instead of just being like, oh, we need to do this. I, I ask of Patrick to do this and mm-hmm. he just does it regardless of if he knows it or not. And I think it comes better of it that we actually have a dialogue that we're yeah. honest about what we know and what we don't know i also have expectations about a product owner that they know stuff yeah but if they don't then we can figure it out as exactly. long as we're honest about that exactly yeah. I, th- I think that's that's the key and that's the challenge yeah and especially um i speak a lot at conferences about supporting junior developers yeah um and one of the things i try to emphasize there is don't underestimate people's fear of being fired. Yeah. Especially when they're in their first job. Like okay. they're terrified. <laughs> like they don't they don't want to appear ignorant or scared or um, you know, or nervous or mm. unsure of themselves because they think if you sense weakness, you'll fire them. Yeah. And unfortunately for the juniors, th- the opposite is normally completely true. If you're asking a lot of questions and being engaged in the topic, yeah. Usually that actually leaves a much better impression. I agree. And as you said, the team lead then knows where you stand. They can actually give you resources to help you. You can, you know, become a really solid developer in a year, two years easily if yeah. you're being really open and honest about what you know and don't know. But unfortunately, a lot of people are coming in with that fear of, oh, you know, if I show that, then they're going to fire me. Yeah. Um, I gave the example before of... Um, do you know what a Docker container is or would you like me to explain it to you again? Um, I think that's a good example because sometimes when you ask people these questions, oh, do you know what a Docker container is? It can almost sound like a, an accusation. like Confrontation. Do you know yeah, what? You know? Exactly. Whereas if you do the, the offer immediately, do you know what a Docker container is or would you like me to explain it? You know, it immediately gives them an out or they go, oh, yeah, maybe you could explain it again. Like yeah. I, th- I think I know, but maybe, you know, give me another explanation or exactly. something. You know, it gives them an immediate opportunity. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a good solution for anyone who is trying to like foster that. Like yeah. don't like check knowledge, but try to check knowledge with an offer of how to help at the same time yeah. so that it's much easier for them to accept it and they don't feel like you're about to fire them yeah. <laughs> when you ask them those questions. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how it was for me, but I didn't have that fear. I think I joined a company and I was like, okay, this is absolutely going to go right and, and my way. <laughs> Or I'm going to get the hell out of here. And I, I know great. that I accepted that from when I started. <laughs> so I think that really might have helped. I'm sure yeah. that that must have helped. Uh, but it, not everyone is like that. No. I, don't, I don't think everyone. So no. it, I really recognize what you're saying. That no, confidence is great. Unique. Like I, yeah. I'm a little bit the same way. I'm an eternal optimist. Yeah. Um, I always go into things being like, oh, this is going to be great. Everything will go perfectly. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, that's just kind of the attitude I, I bring into things. Um, but as you say, not everyone is like that. Other yeah. people have had different experiences. Some people have had, uh, especially career changes. They've come from things like uh, areas like hospitality where they are sometimes treated like absolute crap yeah. by their bosses. You know, they're not used to team environments exactly. where, where people are actually supportive and actually want you to ask questions yeah. and engage with that meaningfully. Um, they're used to environments where they get yelled at if they don't know something yeah. or they get told to like, go clean it up right now, you know, like that. And they have to do it and not be like, why? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or what is a mop? Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> um, and it's important to remember that. Um, also, even university graduates have often worked jobs like that, of yeah. course. Um, so their early experiences of employment are not necessarily conducive to having that kind of confidence that you that you had when you started. Yeah. I do feel like that's another benefit of, of coming into tech as a career changer yeah. as well is that, you know, we, we've we had a few more experiences of the, the real world. We've kind of gotten, well, for me anyway, past the age of 30 especially, I feel like I really stopped caring if people exactly. liked me or not. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I just got to the point where I'm like, all right, I'm just going to like be myself and that's going to that vibe with some lot. people or not and whatever. Yeah. Um, what will be will be, you know, and accepted a bit more the things that I couldn't control, 
you know, and yeah. just said, okay, some people aren't going to like me. That's fine. I don't like everyone. Like, yeah. <laughs> no problem. Goes like, both ways. <laughs> Yeah. Like, sure, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Um, and similarly in the workplace, okay, maybe there will be from time to time someone who doesn't respond positively to a question that I ask. Yeah. Maybe I ask, you know, just going back to what is a container and someone goes, what? Why would you ask that? Yeah. Highly unlikely for any juniors listening at home, highly unlikely that will be the reaction. Maybe it, it is. It could be, yeah. And, and, and if it is, you just have to be like, well, I don't know it and I want to get better. Yeah. End of story. And someone else will be like, oh, okay, great. Let me help you. Exactly. You know, there could be one bad apple from time to time in yeah. a team. Hopefully not the whole team. Um, but the occasional bad apple does crop up. Yeah. But I think part of that confidence that you're talking about is just accepting, okay, there'll be people like that. Yeah. And that's not my problem. That's exactly. their problem. Uh, what my problem is, is becoming the best developer I can be. Yeah. And the best way to do that is to continue learning and to talk to other people because often – People can explain things far better than documentation can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. And I like when my colleagues said that when yeah. they would see me struggling and yeah. they would be like, okay, so we know you can figure it out, right? That's not really the point. <laughs> but if you can figure it out within four hours and I can explain it in like half an hour, choose the option that I explain it, yeah. right? Because ask for help and you'll be faster and better because of it. Because yeah. we are within the team, right? Yeah. I have colleagues next to me that can explain stuff that I don't know in a way because they know me, that will actually be, be beneficial. And sure, everyone can figure everything out because a lot of stuff is online. Yeah. It's just going to vary in time. Yeah. And if it takes too much and time, yeah. ask ask for help. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think the really cool thing as well, and, and I'm sure you can speak mm. to this too, there's this strange phenomenon where if you're stuck on a problem for yeah. like an hour, an hour and a half, and you go, okay, I I, like I have to just ask someone for help. Yeah. As soon as you ask someone for help, you suddenly understand what yeah. you were doing wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly you're like, oh, hang on. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like rubber ducking, the r- rubber duck technique. Um, but you've like, you know, you've typed out this long Slack message explaining what the problem is. Yeah. And then you're about to hit enter and then you go, oh. Delete everything. <laughs> <laughs> delete, delete, yeah. delete, 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 delete. Got it. <laughs> I got it now. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, just another good reason to ask questions. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of externalizing your thoughts yeah. and being confronted with them. Like, oh, okay. Now I, I feel it. <laughs> and now I see the solution to this yeah, problem I'm exactly. describing. About how. What I was still wondering is, because you made a complete career switch, yeah. is how that interview process went. <laughs> Did you have coding challenges, lots of conversations, or lots of screening things where you didn't uh-huh. even go through? Because a lot of that stuff is automated nowadays. Um, so I have the honor of saying I've still never done a technical test. Okay. Um, I feel very lucky. I've been sent one, but yeah. I didn't end up doing it because I got a job offer before I needed to. Yeah. Um, so when I was first applying, it was kind of an accident. I'd kind of said on Twitter, oh, 2021 will be the year I get my first dev job. Very exciting. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And then someone messaged me on Twitter being like, oh, if you're interested, we've got a front end position going. Like, why don't you apply? And I was like, oh, I didn't mean, I didn't mean like now, (laughs) I meant like the whole year. They were like, let's go. (laughs) I was like, all right. And that kind of forced me to create a CV and create a portfolio website and this kind of stuff because the offer was there. I wasn't going to say no. Um, So I was going to try to go for that. Um, And then as part of that process, I recorded a video of myself kind of giving the basics because I, I have a YouTube channel as well that is you know a bit unloved at the moment, mm-hmm. but um, with lots of coding tutorials and, and career stuff. Yeah. And I had this YouTube intro, but it wasn't really appropriate for my website because it was like it was a YouTube channel introduction. Yeah. It wasn't Welcome like to a my meme. YouTube channel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll record a new video specifically for my job search, two minutes like about me, what I'm looking for, etc. cetera. Yeah. I recorded that video. Um, I put it on my website, I put it on my YouTube, I put it on Twitter and that's where things kind of went a bit wild yeah. and um, I got about 12 different messages that night. So within six hours of posting that, that I got about quick. 12 job leads in my inbox. Yeah. Uh, and one of those was the managing director of Novatech and he and I then had a meeting on the Monday. So I'd post it on the Friday, we had a meeting on the Monday yeah. and by the next Monday I'd had another meeting with the team lead Um who was my future um, uh, unit lead. Yep. And the Tuesday I had the contract. Okay. So it went really non traditional. Really quickly. Yeah. And I think they knew, and I was very open with them that I had all these other 
jobs in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, and so they knew, okay, if we don't move fast, we're probably, yeah. she's probably going to go somewhere else. So they managed to kind of bypass the technical test in that specific um, situation. And then, of course, when I was interviewing for my current position, uh, it's a, you know, it's an upper management role. So yeah. the technical test wasn't required. They kind of just took my word for it when I explained what I could and couldn't do with programming because although I will still be doing programming as part of my role, it will yeah. be more like 20 to 30% of my role rather than 80 or 90%. Yeah. Um, so I think they just kind of accepted, okay, um, she's probably telling the truth because why yeah. would she lie? <laughs> yeah, exactly. At this point. <laughs> At this point, like, yeah. why would I lie? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. But have yeah. you ever been on the other side then of yeah. doing uh, uh, an interview in that way and doing an actual, like, take-home coding thing? So not, really. not a take home. Yeah. No, no. I've been in a technical interview before as an yeah. interviewer. Yeah. Um, that was a live one. So what we would do is we'd actually give them an existing um, practice code base yeah. and we'd give them a UML diagram of like the relationship between the data that they would be working with. And then they had to, you know, use Git to you know clone it onto their machine. Yeah. And then they had to run the tests and there would be five failing tests and then they would have to fix them. Okay. And that was basically, that was the test. It was designed to go for, I think, an hour and a half yep. in total. Um, of course, it was assumed that not every bug would necessarily be fixed. Yep. Um, it was more about seeing how they communicate, how they think about problems. Yep. Um, as I say, um, we haven't mentioned my book yet, but, but in one of the things I really focus on in my book about technical tests, because I've spoken to a lot of people about them, of course, yep. um, is that very often that's what they're really testing. Yeah. They're not necessarily testing if you have all these algorithms memorized. Some places are, but most very of the unique. time, <laughs> most of the time what they want to know is, could I work with this person? Yeah. Like, do they know enough to be useful, firstly? Like in terms of how they approach problems, how they get answers. So for example, um, I know that my current company allows people to use Google or whatever to to look up their answers. You know, yeah. it's completely like a normal developer environment. How do people go about finding solutions? Um, how do they think about problems? And if we give them like three tasks, how do they prioritize those tasks? Because yeah. usually a technical test is not designed to actually be finished in that time. Exactly. And often what they want to see is what feature you choose or yeah. what test, what whatever is it is. Approach? Yeah, what's your approach and why? And yeah. Can you explain it? And also when you're doing the test to kind of talk through what you're thinking as yeah. well. I think that's a real skill that people, uh, anyone who's looking for a job, be it junior or senior or any level, should practice before they start the interview process yeah. is actually coding while explaining what you're doing. Imagine that you're in a pair programming session, you know, and you have to narrate what you're thinking and what you're doing and why. Because that takes practice, of course. It's, exactly. it's a form of multitasking and it's hard. You yeah. know? So, so yeah, it's a skill. A lot of these things are skills. And yeah. like any skill, they can be learnt given practice, time and consistency. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I do see it trending towards more of a conversation, I guess, yeah. exactly as you said it. Yeah. I think yours is very non-traditional because it kind of <laughs> came from Twitter world and you were already yeah. out there kind of on social media. I mean, you said you have a YouTube channel. Uh, but for a lot of people, it's traditional coding challenge confrontational because yeah. that already narrows kind of the market mm. um, that we kind of source in in a way because not everyone wants to do that not everyone yeah. will apply to those jobs that require it and a lot so of then, people will yeah, uh, sorry uh, to interrupt but a lot of people will also just actively say no to those now. exactly mm. nowadays they're yeah. like i have various amounts of offers <laughs> i will choose the easier path yeah. or, or kind of same values in companies yeah. but no coding challenge yeah. um so, yeah, we need to figure out a way that also can challenge those things, um, can make it apparent within a, uh, an interviewee, interviewer, mm -hmm. those are hard, um, <laughs> that they have those skills, the skills that we're looking for, that they are valuable, that they don't know everything, sure, yeah. but what are the limitations there? Yeah. Um, and that we can actually hire that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've heard the, the saying, you know, you can train skills, but not attitude. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the same kind of thing. I'm not sure I entirely agree, but... <laughs> I think you can train attitude as well. I, I you mean, can. We grew up you at can. some point. You yeah. can. But, um, but I think, oh, so maybe it's higher for attitude, not skill, or oh, whatever. It's something higher like that. For mindset, maybe. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. But, it, but it's definitely to do with training as well. But that's the thing. I think if someone's got a good mindset and they've got a good attitude and they, 
they are thinking in the right way. Yeah. Like they are, as we as we said earlier, they're breaking down problems in a certain way, or they are approaching um, approaching technical problems in a logical, thought out pattern. Then you know they're on the right track. Sure, yep. they don't know this specific array method or something. Like, okay, yep. fine, you know, but that doesn't make a great developer. Like, really, in the end how you solve problems, yep. that's what makes you a great developer. As you said, learning the programming skills themselves, like you can do that with a Google search. Those are easier. You know? <laughs> yeah. But it's that mindset, training that mindset, both the technical mindset, you know, the, the how to break down problems, how to come up with solutions, um, but also, as we said earlier, this learning mindset, the ability to be open and honest yep. um, and know your worth, you know, because I think everyone everyone brings something unique and something different and I think they should be proud of that and have confidence in that. Absolutely. All of that, that's the stuff that really matters. You know, whether you know, I don't know, C++, but you already know Java and JavaScript, like you'll be fine. You can yeah. learn C++. You'll figure you know? it out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that people should be hiring for and usually are hiring for. And so that's what you have to keep in mind in those interviews is okay, I just need to show that I can communicate these ideas, that yep. I know how to solve problems. And also the one thing lots of people forget mm. that when they're interviewing you, they want to imagine working with you every single day. Yep. Is this someone I want to talk to every single day? So, you know, bring your nicest self basically yeah, because, because they're also hiring for that. Yeah, yeah, I love that. <laughs> let's, uh, let's round it off there. Yeah. Then. I love how this conversation went. Love hearing about how your journey went and how you kind of ended up here. Yeah. Um, everything, the ups and downs in between as well. Is there anything you still want to share? Um, not really. I guess follow me on Twitter. <laughs> I'll put the links in, in the description. My book's out there, out there somewhere. There. Yeah. It's <laughs> going like, to come out in June, right? In July. In, in July. July. Yeah. It's called uh, You Belong in Tech. So as name. I mentioned, yeah, as I yeah. mentioned earlier, that was the one question I had when I started. Yeah. Do I belong? Um, this kind of says, yes, you do. And it's a very super practical guide to getting your first tech job with zero programming knowledge. So it's like how to learn programming, like break it down, like what, what should you do? Yep. It's not a programming book, but it kind of teaches you about how to learn. Yep. Um, then it's about how to blog, how to create an online presence, how to find communities, both in your local area and online. Um, and then it's about the actual application process, interview skills, these kinds of things. It's super practical. It's not wishy-washy at <laughs> all. Um, it's like me. I'm just like, dung, 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 dung. this is how you do it. Bam, bam, yeah. bam. Um, and yeah, it's coming out in July. Should be on Amazon, Kindle, all those normal places. Cool. So, I look forward yeah. to, uh, to checking that out. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Thanks everyone for listening. Anna McDougall, all her stuff will be in the description below. And thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you like the episode and want to support the show, don't forget to leave a rating. Better yet, share the episode with a friend. Let us know in the comment section below what you want to hear, and we'll make it happen. Cheers.